Ladies, gentlemen, and many friends, we are starting. Welcome at the European Institute, where you will see the School of Transnational Governance, the Foreign School. <coughs> Welcome also to our friends from the European Association of Energy Law Associations, because I do not know the detail of their names, to be frank. But the idea I know uh, with Vincente. Uh, George, Lucilla, and Lee are also from school. And uh, maybe it's enough. Maybe I will just show you that you have a folder. In this folder, you have the basics regarding the School of Transnational Governance. You have the basics also about front school. You have the brochure of trainings at Front School with 10 online trainings. And we have fantastic books, particularly this one, State Aid and the Energy Sector, which is something about 500 pages. That's a, literally the book you used to work when you are a lawyer. And you will see also that with Leo, we did one on electricity grids. And I will immediately give the floor to Miguel, because Miguel is the same institute like me, so it's useless to, to say what he can say himself better than me. Miguel. Jean-Michel, thank you, everybody, and uh, welcome to Florence, particularly for those of you as the first visit to Florence, or the European University Institute. Um, I just want to very briefly um, present the School of Transnational Governance since it's the new project of the European University Institute. So, and also a little bit the European University Institute for those of you that may, be not, may not be so familiar with it. So the European University Institute was founded in the 70s uh, as the first and only, and so far I think only genuinely, uh, European uh, research and academic institution and, and the interesting thing is that well, at the time it was founded by the same member states of the European communities at the, at the time, they decided to found with the idea of creating an intellectual community, um, an institution focusing on doctoral training on social sciences. The first remarkable thing is that I believe were the European University Institute to be founded today very difficultly, the social sciences would have been the, the, the focus. It tells us a lot of how the world changed too. I'm not necessarily sure if for the better in that respect, uh, but the idea that the first priority for the member states of the European Union would have been uh, social sciences uh, is interesting and I think it's worth a reflection. But so that was the case. The Institute was for many years focusing only on doctoral trainings. Um, in the areas of uh, law, economics, history, political science, and sociology. Um, in the late 90s, the EY added to that focus on doctoral training, 
the Robert Schumann Center, of which the Florence School of Regulation is currently part. Um, and the Robert Schumann Center basically is an interdisciplinary center um, focused on interdisciplinary research, uh, but then evolved with other dimensions too, such as the Florence School of Regulation. Uh, more recently, the EUI has had a, a postdoctoral dimension with the Max Weber program, and uh, that is a program that aimed at teaching uh, junior academics, so people that have done their PhDs in the past five years and want to follow an academic career, come here to do some training while they are in the job market. And finally, more recently, there was the idea that the EUI should um, have a focus that would allow it both to deal with the emerging governance questions um, that, are, that require forms of governance beyond the state, uh, and also to have a tool and an instrument and a, uh, that will provide an enhanced relationship with the world of policy and also with the world outside the European Union. And it was these three elements that led to the creation of this School of Transnational Governance. So the School of Transnational Governance focuses on the study and teaching of governance beyond the state. And uh, we cover a variety of thematic areas issues where the question and the need for governance beyond the state emerges from migration uh, um, to security to climate change um, to questions of transnational justice and uh, transnational politics. The School of Transnational Governance covers all those issues and also the study of both public and private institutional alternatives that are being developed in terms of transnational governance. Some of them supranational, such as the European Union, that is probably the most developed form of governance beyond the state, uh, but others uh, private or simple forms of cooperation between the states. We study all those different forms and we study the impact of transnational governance both in terms of the supranational, transnational, international, regional models that it leads to, but also in terms of the impact that these transnational issues have on lower levels of government, including, as today, in local government. Uh, we do that uh, by a variety of forms of activity that I'll just very briefly describe to you um, before giving the floor to Georgia. I think it's George. Vincente. Yeah, Vincente, sorry. I th George, you were going to stay silent at this point. This is extraordinary, but I'm sure we, we hear from you later. Uh, so, but before giving the floor to Vicente, um, I just want to briefly describe what are the main areas of activity of the school. So, uh, we have executive training, advanced training on a variety of, of, of topics related to those different areas where issues of governance beyond the state emerge. We have formats similar to this that we call policy dialogues, where we bring together academics, ex uh, experts, policy makers, stakeholders in a particular area to discuss a, uh, a certain topic. And the format there is really to bring people with these different backgrounds and put them around a table. Uh, we have what is the first a fellowship program in an academic and research institution in Europe that is not addressed at academics but at policy makers. So we have our uh, young uh, policy leaders uh, fellowships uh, where we, had a, um, we have a huge success and where we have people that come uh, from uh, public administration, high, level, high levels of public administration to think tanks to non-governmental organizations, to politicians. We've had people from national parliaments and in the applicants we have for next year, we have uh, uh, more than one member of national parliaments throughout the world that come and spend a year, a period between three months and nine months uh, with a series of activities that are tailor-made for them, but also basically benefiting for everything, from everything the UI has to, to offer and having the opportunity to work on a policy idea, on a policy project. Um, so we have that project, that, that, that fellowship program that is extremely successful. Uh, and then we have in the making um, a master program, a two-year master program on transnational governance that we will start in the year 2020, 2021. Uh, this is our basic set of activities. We have many other activities. We have, for example, 
uh, a series called Interviewing the Leaders Beyond the States, where we're interviewing transnational leaders, and we started by interviewing all the former presidents of the European institutions. We're interviewing them in, and making a public interview, but we're also doing a private interview that is deposit in the archives of the European Union because, and this is the last piece of information that I want to convey to those of you that do not know the UI too well, the UI is actually uh, hosts uh, the archives of the European Union. So the archives of the European Union are uh, right to, to my right here. If you go out and you see another <laughs> building in front of you, that's where the archives of the European Union are here. So thank you very much for all of you for coming. Thank you for George and everything and the association also for having this initiative. And uh, Vicente, I give it the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. That's a good morning. It's a great pleasure and honor to be in here again in, in the uh, Florence School of Regulation. Uh, inevitably, it comes to my mind some uh, memories when I'm here again. Uh, I remember the period as a commissioner. I remember very well, George, in 2003, the initiative to, uh, to, to create the, the school and, uh, and the spirit from uh, Loyola de Palacio, old friend also, that, uh, as I said, uh, inevitably comes to my mind her strength, her entrepreneurship spirit, and uh, the ideas very much link with the founding idea of the European Union. So I, I would like also to, to have this little tribute to her once again in this, in this very house and uh, to George that he uh, start this very beautiful initiative. Uh, so it's a pleasure being here. I think it's a very timing m moment. Uh, all, a lot of changes it's uh, surrounding us, but we have to structure uh, to be sure where we wanted to go, and uh, for that purpose, I believe um, in law it would be very useful. Uh, the European Union is a community of history and is a community of law. So many times we mention these these very basic ideas, but uh, in fact, law as a movement coming from uh, the civil society, from uh, experts, from jurists, it has not been very much a, stru a structure. Uh, uh, until, uh, I would say, a year ago when we decided to create uh, this, uh, this organization that we call EFELA, European Federation of uh, Energy Law National uh, Associations. That is, I, I would like to underline something coming directly from civil society, from independent experts, from different routes, uh, academy, practitioners, um, companies, um, public administration, uh, commissioners, uh, court of justice, and all together we're trying to make this exercise to analyze, to study, to make reflections. Uh, if we are able to do it, to make proposals uh, playing a role as a new stakeholder of this process and decision-making process in the field of the European uh, new energy law. So we are independent. Um, we bring together a group of experts, experts in energy law and regulation. Uh, we also represent the diversity of uh, legal traditions, even though we are very much committed and, uh, with the European energy law values, legal values and principles. And uh, we promote cooperation within another organization at the European level, been very much uh, aware that of today nothing could be done without this kind of linkages and networking in a very professional way. And we very much also welcome this initiative in terms to analyze the local government and the level of governance that they would need. Because uh, we are convinced that today there is not only some changes or enlargements in the, in the uh, core of the energy law, but it's something very much transformative and new in the all fields of the uh, energy as such. So uh, and there are so many, not only internal factors, but external fa factors that, uh, that are impacting very much the, ener the energy sector and as a consequence of it also the energy, the energy law. Uh, for the first time, perhaps in history, we are not waiting something that it would pass in a, 
it technically in a spillover process, but it's something much more transformative. There is not something that it uh, represents a change from an old technology to a new one, but it's something that is affecting different sectors, very much interrelated, that we have to discover, and we have to react very rapidly ex ante, as uh, regulators, ex ante, so preparing the field for the changes that it would uh, immediately come. One very important point in our work, and we'll try to develop, is to fix and to establish, or at least to propose, a new set of principles of energy law. And also to mobilize a new sort of consolidation of the energy law, codification, if possible, of the energy law in a very coherent way. So uh, trying to assure through that movement's stability in the legal frameworks, predictability, in a moment of huge and very rapidly accelerated uh, change. So to the so common and well-established three Ds, we wanted also to establish a new seas of coherence, codification, and clean, uh, clean energy law. So, uh, governance is one of the main pieces of this new um, legislative package that uh, coming from the European Union, and we are very much uh, delighted to contribute from our reflections and from our ideas and initiatives to this debate. Our organization counts with uh, today, even is a very young one, uh, we could say that we represent 15 countries all around Europe and we do hope to represent almost 20 in the middle of these very years. So, uh, we held uh, several meetings during the last year, some extraordinarily interesting, for instance, one journey that we have with the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, exchanging about different topics in the energy law and the ma main, I would say, relevant landmarks that it has came from the court during the last three decades. And uh, we also had a very interesting meeting with the European Commission in, in Brussels a few weeks ago, so we have a very interesting agenda to be covered in the, in the months to come. So once again, thank you so much for your invitation. It's a great pleasure being here. Local communities are consumers at the end also. And for us to develop these interactions from the energy law with uh, consumers open a very interesting field. So thanks again and thank you so much, Jean-Michel, for your invitation and the inspiration that always it provides this house. Thanks to you, Vicente. Ladies and gentlemen, you are being recorded by Matthew there and Matthias. If you don't like it, just go to them and say, I don't want to be recorded, and they will erase you with all techniques known since the beginning of the 20th century to erase, to erase somebody from a, a recording. And now we are starting the workshop, and we are starting the workshop with Lucilla and George. Thank you. Good morning to everybody, and thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you to Jean-Michel and Miguel and Vicente and to their respective organizations for having arranged this seminar today in these times where uh, international cooperation seems so difficult and people seem to be more interested in leaving and destroying than in joining and cooperating. I think that the simple fact that these three organizations cooperated in order to try to start doing something new together is already in itself something that should be underlined. Um, I have uh, made a small presentation together with uh, Lucila. If you have any questions uh, afterwards, please uh, address them to Lucila, uh, either today or uh, afterwards, uh, per email or per phone. So very briefly, uh, <clears throat> where what is this exercise about? Well, I, I try to, we try to capture this in this picture, meaning that uh, if we think about uh, a two-dimensional space where we have different levels of governance and different sectors, economic, social sectors, and if we <clears throat> start with the national monopolies, that was the situation we had in Europe before 
liberalization started in 1996. And what we did for many years after the single European Act was approved in 1986 uh, was to, to build a single European energy market. And so for 20 years or more than 20 years, the efforts have been directed to, towards the creation of a liberalized supranational market. Okay, that was the basic goal of the single market idea. So moving from the national level to the EU level. Of course, this has not yet been fully achieved. There are many achievements, uh, remarkable ones, that make Europe uh, much more advanced than any other part of the world in terms of integration of uh, electricity and gas markets, but uh, there is room for improvement. What happens is that in the meantime, our new public policies, namely as regards climate change, lead to a need to decarbonize and digitalize our infrastructures, and in particular, our electricity infrastructures. So if we think about uh, governance, what we are doing somehow is to shift the center of gravity from the EU level to the local level. So we were at the national level, first we went up to the EU, and now we are going down to the local level. If we look now at the sectors, we can say that uh, at the beginning, we were living in a world of silos. So electricity was a silo, gas was a silo, coal was a silo, transportation was another silo, with their own industrial monopolists with their own administrative and political representation. With the internal market, what we saw was a certain um, combination of gas and electricity because gas was the major primary energy source used for electricity generation in the years of liberalization due to the economics of gas and due to technological changes that happened in the 80s, early 90s. So we, we saw a slow beginning of interaction between different energy-related areas. But with the decarbonization, uh, what we see is a much more comprehensive interaction between all energy-related sectors. And this is, where we all know, a very uh, politically sensitive issue. Uh, look, for instance, at what's going on in Germany nowadays with the, the climate uh, law, and we have similar discussions in other countries. When it comes to a clear allocation of responsibilities in terms of CO2 emissions to different sectors, inevitably we have to discuss how we want to shape the interactions between these different sectors. And this is true at national level, but this is also true at the national level. So what we see here is a different word, a different perspective to look at the energy-related areas, uh, combining all energy-related sectors and putting the the emphasis at the local level. And we don't have, to be very frank, in spite of all the new directives and regulations, in spite of the so-called fourth energy package, we don't have yet uh, a clear, comprehensive legal framework for this transition and for the way to shape things at local level. This is nothing new. And I would like to make a parallel here with the situation we face today with the situation we faced 20 years ago with liberalization. This was already mentioned by Vicente. Uh, Florence played a very important role in the creation of the uh, European uh, energy market. Why? Because the first directives of 96 just stated very general principles. The end of monopolies. Everything is free. Everybody can trade electricity and gas across borders. But these directives stated no rules. There were no rules. Nobody knew how to do that. 
and the incumbents have no interest at all in making the life easy for this kind of new liberalized transactions. So what happened was that nothing happened for a while. And then it was realized, namely by the European Commission, that something had to be done. And it could be either a, a second package of legislation, improving the first one, or a different kind of approach. And that was the, the, the approach that was selected, a kind of a voluntary approach through the so-called uh, Florence Forum or Electricity Regulatory Forum, which takes place regularly here in Florence since 1998. And thanks to this kind of informal forum, it was possible uh, in less than two years to come to an agreement, on a voluntary agreement, establishing the, the rules for cross-border electricity trade. And these rules, these basic rules, they have been improved, of course, and modified, but these basic rules still hold. They are still the, the, the backbone of our internal electricity market, these basic principles that were agreed on a voluntary basis 20 years ago. Later on, these principles were em, em, embodied in new legislation, in the second package, in the third package, and so on. But it was thanks to this voluntary approach that things started happening. And I believe, I believe on, on this kind of voluntary approach, and I believe on, on institutions and on law, but I also live on the private initiative. And that's why I believe that we can now somehow replicate that kind of uh, approach and make uh, things happen at the local level much uh, faster than uh, it is uh, foreseen with the existing legislation. So uh, the question we face here is how to strengthen the internal energy market. We don't want to lose, to abandon what we have uh, achieved, but at the same time we want to uh, accelerate the development of uh, local energy communities and the new type of energy governance. And the answer is, uh, to that question is that we need to design and to implement a new energy governance. Now, that's very fine, but what does it mean? It, we have identified at least five dimensions, but we are here to discuss this, and maybe you have other dimensions to add. Uh, there is an obvious uh, technical management dimension. We are talking about physical infrastructures. We are about talking about electricity, district heating and cooling, transportation, physical infrastructures. They have to be technically managed, so there is a need to articulate these different technical systems. Uh, these infrastructures support liberalized markets. We have liberalized markets for electricity, for gas, for uh, many other uh, services and products, so we have to see how to combine these different markets. On the other hand, especially thanks to digitalization, we see new types of business models and new types of um, interactions between different market agents. How to, to cope with that uh, innovation. Then we, we have the institutional dimension Think about regulation, for instance, how to articulate local and national and EU regulation. And then we have also the need to, uh, um, to, to coordinate policies at local and national and EU level. This, I believe, this dimension has been already extensively addressed, namely in the new governance regulation. But nevertheless, it's uh, uh, one dimension where uh, work has to be done. And, uh, and we also need to address some new issues. For instance, we see that uh, more and more the European Commission uh, uh, favors uh, the use of financial instruments to shape policies. It's not only a matter of directives and regulations nowadays, it's also uh, uh, leading or, or shaping the, the transformations, the transitions through uh, the use of financial instruments, sometimes with more success, sometimes with less success, but we are here to, to hear about that and how we can combine both, uh, both uh, views, both approaches. Uh, we have questions like uh, the concession contracts, uh, and the uh, dissent has been in the, in the public procurement committee since the beginning. Uh, so public uh, procurement, concession contracts versus regulation, how 
should they work together? Consumer access, consumer rights versus uh, unfair commercial practices. Prosumers, what is the legal status of prosumers? How can they act at local level or even at national level? The question of combination of different ownerships, this was done in the past, in the old times of monopolies. How can we imagine this, these new relationships in the, in the era of digitalization and uh, so many virtual platforms? The role of public buildings and public uh, uh, assets as energy consumers and possibly also as energy producers. And uh, what is the role of, of uh, participation of civil society in all this transformation? So these are the kind of new issues that we feel need to be considered when we think about uh, the new governance. And that's, that's the, the reason why this uh, uh, seminar was organized, to discuss all these issues and other issues that you think are relevant for this discussion and to try to, to establish a cooperation uh, in order to advance in these um, areas, um, having a, a more clear uh, conceptual framework for the local energy governance, then to translate this model into appropriate legal and regulatory language to have a kind of uh, voluntary code, uh, and finally to provide the necessary training to all involved parties. But uh, I'm sure that at the end of uh, today we will have more clear ideas about if, when, and how this could happen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. So we are going to enter the session one. So most of the people have to move and the speakers have to join around Miguel. Just one question, Lucille, you're not talking now then. Everybody to my right, no one wants to come to my left, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, um, unfortunately, Telmo Batazar has not been able to come. Uh, is, um, so we start with the other three speakers, and the first speaker I have is uh, Sabine, uh, I hope I will say your name right, Lachtenig. <laughs> So good morning, thank you very much for the invitation. Heidelberg is doing climate protection since 92. And how does it work? Or shall I take the laptop? Also, as a PowerPoint, so maybe it's the reason. This is a PDF. 
Thank you. So cities are the starting point for an urban development. We have um, energy utilities in cities, and we have um, our own banks. We have our own um, renewable plants. And Heidelberg is part of several city networks, for instance, C40, ICLEI, the Climate Alliance, and our mayor is also president of Energy Cities and we work together um, in the Covenant of Mayors with 7,800 other cities working on energy issues. And our Lord Mayor is also part of the European Covenant Board uh, from the Euro European Commission. For Heidelberg, we have 160,000 inhabitants, are a student city with nearly 40,000 uh, 40, students, and we have 100. 20,000 jobs. The milestones for climate protection in Heidelberg were already in 1992. Uh, I think Reinhard Six already worked with the research institute uh, EFOI on our first climate protection concept. We have already uh, done in 93 um, a subsidy program for private households to get subsidized for people who run away to their houses. Um, concerning citizen participation, we have a project with schools that started in 1992 so that uh, people in schools are participating on energy savings. Uh, with the support of the European Commission, SAFE2, we got, founded our um, energy agency already in 1997. And concerning sustainable development, we founded in 1999 a, a local agenda office and started in 2001 a project called Sustainable Management in Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises. So these were the milestones in the first beginning of the climate uh, um, activities of the city of Heidelberg. And we have already in the 90s an energy concept so that uh, the city is a model that every house that is renovated or built in Heidelberg is built as a passive house. So that was a regulation which was um, below the national energy standard. And now, uh, since seven years, we are part of a national program called Master Plan 100% Climate Protection, and our goal is to have 95% CO2 reduction and 50% um, energy reduction. So what are the role of cities in Germany in climate protection? So city is a consumer and a model. City is giving impulses and coordinates projects, and we are also a planner because we develop several new di city districts, and we give advice through energy advice, and are promoter of subsidy programs. And the city is also an energy uh, runs an energy regional energy utility and a service agency for electricity, heat, and water. Um, we have a lot of cooperation with partners in the city and the region. Um, I think my office only runs 15 round tables with different stakeholders concerning climate protection. We have a round table with craftsmen. We have a round table with churches, with energy advisors, uh, with building companies, um, round tables on mobility, and round tables on regional bio fair trade products and also on um, sustainable education. So this is a long process in the city of Heidelberg to cooperate with different stakeholders within the city. And we set up guidelines for citizen participation which were replicated worldwide, uh, Germany-wide. So it's really a process how citizens can bring in uh, their inputs and how it is going on with the uh, decisions of the city council. So this is the master plan, 100% climate protection. We want to become climate neutral until 2050. 
and it's a process which was developed together with the citizens and the stakeholders, and they set up together with the research institute, the EFOI, a climate protection plan with around 200 measures of what should be done in Heidelberg to um, reach these goals. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the stakeholder dialogue and the citizen dialogue, we also have a dialogue with the youth. So there is every year a youth climate summit where the youth discusses what should be done in Heidelberg for climate protection. So this is, for instance, one stakeholder, a round table with stakeholders. You see there are NGOs in it, there are hospitals, the university, science, ut energy utilities, companies, finance institutes, um, as such. So these are some pictures concerning the participation of citizens in Heidelberg, how we work. Um, and the focus of the master plan are um, a renovation, and construction, climate neutral mobility, climate neutral university, since it's, um, they offer the main jobs in Heidelberg, renewable energies, energy efficiency, and con consumption and nutrition, because everybody has the possibility to do its own job. So we have a, as many cities as CO2 balance that can be done by everybody, so he can see his own footprint, uh, how much CO2. Um, he needs for his life. And the other one, the last one of the uh, focus is communication and citizen participation. Um, in 97, the regional energy agency was found. Now it has over 50 cities that are involved in the energy agencies in the region. And they offer support for the citizens as well. Uh, they run also programs for the cities and offer further education programs for architects and craftsmen. Uh, this is our regional energy utility and it provides heat, electricity uh, and water and also runs the um, swimming pools and the garages. Concerning renewable energies, uh, we run several solar campaigns um, to increase uh, solar energy and we work closely together with a a solar cooperative which was found by students from the university and there is also a cooperative um, in Heidelberg um, which runs all kind of cooperatives in German wide. We also have a biomass plant and um, all hydropower plants along the river. And that is the projects for education for sustainable development. We work close together with schools, kindergartens, and sports clubs um, to uh, sensitize them for energy issues and do further education programs for teachers and for the trainers of the sports clubs. Uh, we are part of a European project called Engage and it was an idea from Heidelberg to start posters with slogans, um, what everybody does to um, protect the climate. And it started in 2007. And at the moment, there are nearly 7,000 posters and participants from Europe. And this was subsidized by Intelligent Energy in Europe. Um, oh. It's very important to work together with companies and introduce a sustainable management program um, with companies. So far, more than 135 companies were involved in the program for a sustainable economy. They are offered workshops to train the employees and to set up an energy management program. And we work together with networks also in the region for um, companies. This is a promotional program for subsidies for investments. Um, here, the city offers 1.5 million euro per year for insulating houses. This is much more than you get from the national uh, level for renovation um, houses. So to give some incentives for the people. Concerning mobility, uh, which is a big part for CO2 reduction, we try to improve our public transportation system, um, increase the lanes of, for bicycles, and to improve um, the modal split. 
we also ha there have um, subsidized programs for um, vehicles who are electric, hydrogen cars, or also if somebody um, gives his car back and then he gets a free ticket for public transportation. And this is more money than we get from the uh, national level, um, but so far we have a national program, clean energy, uh, clean air, and there the, the cities get money for alternative mobility programs. Uh, we have several um, combined heat and power plants um, in our city to generate our own energy. And this is just in construction. It's an energy and future storage of our energy utility <coughs> to store heat. Concerning the city development, we build a complete new district in passive houses. So every kindergarten, hotel, um, supermarket, every building is built in a passive house standard. It's a law by the city um, that it's only allowed to buy, to build these kind of energy standard. So these are some imp impressions. It consists of offices, but also special buildings like, um, for instance, um, hotels and others. So it's a carbon neutral urban district. It will have 6,000 jobs, 6,500 inhabitants, and it has a reduced heat energy demand by through the passive house. Uh, concerning in Germany, in Heidelberg, we had 10,000 Americans that left a few years ago, so we have now new areas um, that could be developed, and these are with former uh, facilities, and we also try to install there an energy concept um, <coughs> that only passive houses are built and also uh, PV systems are installed and district heat energy should be um, generated there. Um, we build a Heidelberg Innovation Park combining climate protection projects with um, smart city um, projects um, and electromobility and there will be district heating, district cooling and solar energy production. Concerning the cooperation of Heidelberg in uh, city networks, I mentioned it, um, this was the foundation of the Covenant of Mayors in Germany, here in Heidelberg. Uh, we work together with the city networks, um, energy cities, our mayors, they're the president, ICLAI, Climate Alliance, and we are innovator in the C40 network. So how can cooperation between cities and city networks improve governance? Um, it helps us to exchange best practice and pilot projects. Uh, we also have an association of German cities on the national level, so it's common lobbying for energy directives on the national level and also for funding structures for cities on the national level. But it's also important to have a lobbying on EU level, so our mayor is part of the European um, Covenant of Mayors Board and they have regular meetings with the European Commission and members of the uh, DGs, um, energy city writes papers concerning EU directives on renewable energy directive, clean energy package for all, and also common papers from city networks. That's, I think, a good development that happens on the EU level that the city networks work together and lobby for good conditions for cities on the European level because we can't change the consumption of cars in Heidelberg or in Germany, that has to be regulated on EU level. We, do, we have a national law on the feed-in tariff system for renewables in Germany, but I think there should be one on the EU and the national level, and there should be more ambitious regulations on the EU level, and even maybe also a European Parliament of Mayors um, that can bring in um, ideas to the European level. Um, I just want to invite you uh, to an international conference on climate action uh, this year in Heidelberg. It is on vertical integration of all four levels, international, national, regional, and local level. It's organized our, by our national environmental ministry, the Ministry of the 
region and the city of Heidelberg and all kind of city networks also uh, offer workshops and it will take place from the 22nd to the 23rd of May and we would be happy to welcome you here. These are the topics of the um, conference. It's on vertical integration, multi-level governance, smart cities and all um, aspects on climate protection. And we will also offer you excursions um, to show the region um, on climate protection around Heidelberg. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you very much, I think, for the invitation. It's always nice to visit Heidelberg, beautiful city. Um, and now we have uh, Martin Gulberg from Tilburg. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you my oh, mic, whatever you prefer. Good morning. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, it's great to be back in Florence, even though it's colder than in the Netherlands right now, actually. Um, so um, I'd like to, uh, uh, well, briefly uh, discuss with you, uh, present something on mul what I've called multi actor multi-level governance of the energy transition. And my initial title was solving the coordination puzzle. But that was a bit too ambitious, I guess. So I added two words, uh, because it's also very much uh, uh, in the process of uh, thinking about this. Um, I outline my argument here, so if I don't get to the conclusions, then I've, in any, any case, outlined it here. Uh, so I, uh, I see the, and we think we all uh, can agree on that, the energy transition is a societal challenge that evokes all kinds of complex multi-actor and multi-level governance challenges and that give rise to a uh, well, coordination puzzle to address those uh, challenges and, in fact, to deliver the energy union or realize the energy transition. Uh, all kinds of uh, climate and energy goals have been set at the various levels of governance. Um, and um, a governance mechanism for the energy union has been developed to steer the member states towards reaching those, uh, yeah, the EU-level targets um, a key remaining challenge, I think, is, uh, lies with involving citizens in the member states and steering or shaping, as it, as it was just referred to, uh, cities and regions towards reaching national targets. Um, and um, um, the governance mechanism, as it is now in the, uh, uh, in the regulation on the energy union, uh, doesn't say much about the local and regional levels as such. So that governance mechanism, my argument would be, needs to be extended to also include uh, those. Uh, it's not that it's, there's nothing happening there. I think Sabina just outlined uh, there's a lot happening there, much more than at other levels, actually, and much more real stuff. Uh, um, uh, so it's, it, uh, earlier it was said, you know, we, need, we are moving down to the, the local level. That has always a bit of a a negative connotation, uh, so I think that that's where the actual action is, so I, moving down to that level, I think that's not the right words, but, so there's lots of experimentation, learning already from the early 90s, as uh, Sabina outlined, uh, but I think uh, there are some unresolved issues as w when it comes to, uh, and, the, and the, the case of the Netherlands shows that, um, that should be taken up as part of the governance of the energy union. So that is my general argument. So the society, well, energy transition is a societal challenge. I think we can uh, agree on that, that um, it's much more than simply a technological uh, challenge. Uh, I used to be at the University of Delft, a technological university where they thought they could fix it, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in technologically speaking. Uh, we've now come to realize that it's uh, just as much or even more societal challenge, which uh, with political constraints, economic constraints, uh, differences of opinion or different views on what the actual pro underlying problem is. And in fact, uh, as, also, as uh, is apparent now uh, in, in the Netherlands, it's election time everywhere. It's election time all the time, but there's elections in the Netherlands and actually energy and climate is very much uh, on the agenda now. And uh, uh, quite a bit of resistance uh, when it comes to uh, uh, that transition. Um, um, 
it requires, nonetheless, the support of uh, uh, multiple actors, public, private, societal, multiple levels, global until the, uh, until the regional and local. So it really requires multi-actor, multi-level uh, governance. Uh, what still what we see is that actors uh, you know, kind of adopt a wait and see attitude. So the question is, more generally speaking, how to move from a situation of, I think this is the, how the commission put it, from a situation uh, from where you have a decision by few to action by all, basically. So that's the kind of the conundrum. Uh, so that's basically make this system, this complex multi-actor, multi-level system uh, work. So this from the EU institutions to national ministries, local and regional authorities, back to uh, the EU level, and then not merely focus on public actors, but also include uh, obviously global actors uh, and, and, and uh, not in the least uh, private and societal actors. Um, to, uh, as, a st as a starting point, I think that's also the starting point for a lot of the governance, also at the European level. Uh, we see that, uh, we know that climate and energy targets have been developed as part of the, um, the, the Paris process for the, the targets for the EU member states, uh, EU and its member states. We know that we have uh, EU-level targets for energy efficiency and renewables, nationally binding uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets, and the, the, so that picture on the, uh, um, in the left uh, corner, you know uh, that's Paris, but below you probably don't know that's the Netherlands because these types of uh, uh, conferences are also being held at other levels. So in the left you see the, the Dutch uh, uh, agreement on en uh, energy in 2013, and currently, um, and the other picture is of a draft uh, agreement of a draft climate, uh, um, uh, uh, or the, the draft climate agreement in the Netherlands. So we see at various levels climate and energy targets uh, being set. So the key question is, in, in absence of formal hierarchy, how to ensure that individual member states' contributions add up to reach collective EU level targets and then uh, uh, related to renewables and energy efficiency, and how to ensure that individual local regional contributions add up to reach collective national level greenhouse gas reduction targets. So there's uh, uh, you know, multiple uh, uh, challenges here. So that requires, uh, as was uh, acknowledged, a framework, model, mechanism for well, non-hierarchical coordination in the union. Um, what the regulation has come up, what's in the regulation is basically, well, the definition of a political process, so how the member states and the commission have to work together and how individual member states should co cooperate. Um, you may be aware of the fact that member states are called upon to prepare a uh, national energy and climate uh, plan. So member states have prepared these or, and drafts are available. Um, and they're also asked to prepare long-term strategies uh, so for until 2050. And the idea is that underlying this process and these plans is um, uh, you know, streamlining and integration of all kinds of existing planning, reporting, and monitoring obligations under uh, various uh, agreements. Uh, so that uh, this also fits uh, the, the, the planning, uh, reporting, and monitoring obligations, for instance, for the Paris process. Uh, in, you know, interesting here is that there's relatively you know, limited powers for the Commission to ensure actual implementation on the ground. I mean, uh, measures, uh, 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 member states are be called, can be called upon to take corrective measures, recommendations can be made, but in essence it's, you know, it's, it remains uh, non-hierarchical. Um, so it looks a bit like this, what we call uh, experimental governance. So there's broad framework goals and uh, some system of uh, planning, reporting, and monitoring being developed at the, at the EU level. Then the member states can decide themselves on how to reach targets, so there's room for flexibility in order to adapt to uh, local circumstances. Uh, then the member states are uh, to report frequently to the Commission about results, and, and this is something that is actually not in there, take part in peer learning processes, but something that we're going to discuss, I guess, today. Uh, 
When there's insufficient progress, uh, the member states must uh, uh, take recommendations into account, but uh, you know, they must take utmost account of recommendations, and that's basically it. They, um, uh, under the greenhouse gas reduction targets, they, uh, they have to take corrective measures. So it's not entirely voluntary, but still it remains non-hierarchical. So, and, and there are some per periodic evaluation of uh, goals and the planning, reporting, monitoring system. So that's very much the type of governance that's been uh, put in place and that we know from other uh, uh, fields of um, EU governance. Uh, then there's two interesting elements in the regulation that I want to uh, um, uh, highlight. So there's um, uh, an, an article on public consultation, which is actually focused quite traditionally on well, consultation with the public for these national uh, uh, plans. Uh, so it really is not about involving citizens and other stakeholders from the bottom up as the kind of examples that uh, Sabine just outlined. Another interesting uh, uh, article in the regulations about regional cooperation. Well, this is very much focused on regions as well, in, uh, interstate regions, so neighboring member states coordinating their efforts uh, as part of these plans. So there's not much on you know, neighboring cities and their surroundings, so intrastate type of uh, collaboration. So, that, so both are, uh, I mean, in, in one way uh, very traditional, in another way very much focused on, uh, on regions as, um, as intrastate entities. Uh, whereas, um, I, I only have one slide about what's happening at the local and regional level, but uh, uh, my, my uh, it's been outlined lots of ha uh, things happening. This is in Dutch, but so in the area where I work, where Lee also works, the Tilburg area in the southern part of the Netherlands, uh, we had actually a, a, a local or an, a regional uh, energy agreement in the Netherlands. Now we have uh, a regional energy climate and energy strategies uh, being developed in uh, all the various regions. So in the middle is the picture of the Netherlands with the various regions. So the regions are in the process of developing themselves, you know, kind of like the plans that the Commission is uh, asking the member states to, uh, to draw up. Um, uh, so you see lots of these pictures uh, as we've seen uh, before, but then on the local and the regional level. Um, so it's, um, um, it's uh, not, as, not always voluntary. Uh, there's also a bit of, uh, I mean, it's there, the regions are uh, not merely asked, they are, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're supposed to do this. Um, the idea is that um, by involving regions and cities in those regions, there is a level of uh, you know, differentiation possible, some level of pluriformity, uh, and that it also requires um, uh, exper or also enables experimentation, learning, and indeed some, some innovation and social innovation, so more than simply technical uh, innovation, so in terms of the, 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 the responsibilities and the relationships between actors, and that the region serves kind of as an arena for coordination and collaboration as it you know, combines sufficient scale at, with at the same time uh, you know, proper uh, connectedness, right? There's proximity, there's interdependencies, there's mutual trust, which is necessary to actually get actors uh, moving, right? So the idea is then that you develop through uh, also these uh, regional uh, energy and climate plans, kind of like energetic, what is called energetic, energetic society and, and economy. There are some unresolved issues though. I mean, not all... Uh, 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 cities and regions are so uh, politically committed as, for instance, uh, Heidelberg uh, seems to be. Uh, there's quite a bit of variation there. Uh, also, uh, the available capacity on the ground varies a lot. I mean, there's bigger cities that have, you know, uh, uh, people working on these issues. You have a separate uh, entity, even like smaller cities don't have hardly any people working on this. They lack the expertise. Um, then there's um, a lot of these processes remain uh, limited to public actors, uh, so engagements of citizens and other stakeholders, uh, at least is, uh, in the case of the Netherlands, uh, is still limited. Uh, energy cooperatives are involved, network operators are also involved, but I mean the, the, the process in the Netherlands of these energy and climate, regional energy and climate plans starts, usually starts off very much as something for you know, public, local and re regional authorities, and then it's quite difficult to involve uh, um, uh, others uh, after a while. 
Then there's a, the, the challenge of scaling up what has been developed at the local and regional level to higher levels, right? Scaling up uh, those tailor-made regional solutions because you develop them at the regional and local level because you can customize them, but then how to scale these things up because they're very much uh, uh, fit for that uh, particular region or city. Uh, as we have at the European level, there's the challenge of coordinating among these regions. So we see now, well, one of the interesting things is that these regions all focus inwards. So they look at their own region and try to get uh, uh, climate neutral uh, themselves, whereas you know, uh, some coordination with a neighboring region may uh, uh, tell them that it uh, perhaps is, you know, they perhaps could do something together and uh, work together on, on, on particular issues. Um, there's tension between the national governments in, in the Netherlands uh, here and subnational governments, and this also has to do with that coordination issue. The uh, Netherlands, the Dutch government, uh, uh, you know, forces regions to come to uh, uh, agreement, so to speak. Uh, regions are not always willing; they're not always able, uh, and the, the, the idea of a partnership is really something that still needs to develop. And there's the interesting question, and which is, I think is also um, an unresolved issue still at the European level, in spite of the procedures in place, is how do you, uh, uh, so what's the, uh, what's the knowledge uh, infrastructure when you have to monitor, uh, evaluate, uh, you know, also technical issues, what do you have available, right? So in the Netherlands, so at the national level, we have uh, government think tanks who do this. So what about the local uh, level, what kind of, in knowledge infrastructure do we have there? So towards uh, finalization, so, um, and solving that coordination puzzle, uh, I, um, if we, I, um, in order to accelerate the, the delivery of the energy union, I think that we need to uh, realize the potential for exper experimentation and learn on the basis of early insights, in insights gained by cities as Heidelberg, other regions in the European Union, and exchange uh, what has already been uh, uh, learned you know, for, uh, for, um, th through all kinds of other projects. Because it's, it's not that nothing's happening at the local and regional levels. In fact, there's much more happening, I think. Um, then the question is you know, how, how to uh, um, draw those lessons that require some level of monitoring, evaluation of these experiments, so what works and why, and uh, some idea about how to scale those up. I think we need to think about building capacity and support at local and regional levels and not necessarily top down as we would from the European perspective would know how this works, but you know, kind of horizontally among cities and regions. Um, I think we can still uh, uh, work on closer co cooperation between the commission, the member states and cities and regions. I, I think we just heard that there's collaboration or at least some coordination between the commission and cities and regions and their representative bodies. I think it would be good to uh, uh, kind of in involve the member states there as well, even though you know, they, they perhaps play a, dif uh, a, di uh, a difficult or different role there. Uh, but when drawing up these plans and strategies, some level of coordination between what's happening between the European level and the member state level and between what's, hap and between what's happening uh, at the uh, member states and local regional level is necessary. That, that, in that connection seems to be missing. So that requires a you know, process of continuous uh, interaction. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are very um, much on time. So now we have Paolo Bertoldi from the European Commission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Why the my slides are going to be uploaded? I just uh, have a piece of an active historical information. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, George Vasconcelos for inviting me to this today's workshop. And uh, remember that uh, in the 90s, I was in the commission in the G17 at the time, doing the, in the electricity unit, working on this uh, first tentative to change the electricity market. And it was in Euroelectric. And we were having discussion already at the time on this kind of topics that then this become history, but we did a lot of progress. Since then, I moved to another part of the commissions in the early 2000s, not doing any more policy, writing directives or fighting lobbyists, but uh, more doing research for policy 
and I move a bit from uh, energy to climate change, but still uh, been following the European development. And today I'm going to present you, uh, what is the, to advance the slide, the, I need Closer. the, oh. okay. I'm going to present you the comment on mayors and a, a, a strong and successful program in the European Union, a voluntary program for local authorities, in particular municipalities, uh, which is now 10 years old. And we heard uh, a pioneer cities that inspired this, this kind of movement. I mean, German cities, Heidelberg, uh, Freiburg, that were leading already in the 90s. And, uh, and this, uh, but not, as you know, the European Union has different speed, different culture. And based on their experience, we built up uh, uh, with the city networks, Climate Alliance and Energy Cities, the comment of mayors, which now is a global initiative. I'm going to give you some um, result and some perspective also from a governance point of view. Um, very much has been already mentioned, the national, in European and international frame, starting maybe for international from the Paris Agreement, they need to reduce emissions uh, dramatically to reach 1.5, so a complete change of our uh, energy systems, transportation system and life, most probably, with carbon neutrality under 2050. And very recently the European Union uh, sorry, the European Commission has put forward a, a long-term strategy for climate and energy, which calls for Europe to be carbon neutral by 2050. So it means a big penetration of renewables, not only in electricity, but also in heating, cooling, and transportation, and also a big role for starting to absorb more and more emissions uh, with uh, uh, looking at land use, land use change and forestry. And of course, we have now the 2030 target of uh, emissions, renewables, and efficiency, uh, which have been negotiated. They are now in, in EU law. As you know, in emission, we can do a bit better. We can go around 45 with current measures, especially TS and, and, and renewable energy efficiency. Uh, they are already called to, um, to improve on this. And this package of targets are the present EU NDC for at, at 2030s under the Paris Agreement. And of course, in 2023, the, the, the unions should update us, every other country around the world, and in up the convention, these uh, NDCs. And most of all, is, is there is a chance that this target can be reinforced. Now, uh, the comment of mayors, uh, it started with the mitigation only, then uh, focus also on adaptation and access to energy, which some, somehow also uh, include the energy poverty that's not been mentioned today, but it's an important uh, uh, part of uh, the consumer engagement. You, we do not want that consumer <coughs> suffer uh, because they don't have uh, uh, enough eating or cooling or, uh, or they cannot keep their warm their houses. And, and outside the, un uh, the European Union, of course, there's still a lot of people needing access. And, and uh, careful energy and, and climate planning can also allow participation of all cities and to the uh, needed services, especially the energy and water services. And, and it's also important to notice that uh, um, the, this, this comment on mayors started a, a very in, a interesting concept that you, you do energy and climate planning together, not just an, a climate plan, energy plan, as, and now the European governance, as my previous speakers, has arrived with some concept, not any more separate renewable efficiency, energy plan, and climate plan, but all together because you have a better chance to capture, to get, to reach the goal if you have an holistic views. And a city level is also important when you do a, a planning, uh, look at a, a mobility plans, a waste plan, a water plans, because they are all interlinked that services and concept that can be, uh, all have to contribute to the, the goals, of course, of reducing CO2 emissions, but also the, to increase the sustainable development in the cities. And this is the history, basically, 2008 in Europe. Then we uh, launched also the adaptation part. We combined the same. And this initiative was so successful that uh, there was a small initiative by Bloomberg called Compact on Mayors with 100 cities, and they decided to merge with us to, to create a global covenant on mayors. Uh, which is now operating basically throughout the, the, the globe uh, with a lot of EU support, especially in developing countries. And now if we focus to Europe, um, we have 8,800 cities. 
uh, not only in European Union properly, but also in Norway, uh, neighboring countries, West Balkans, Ukraine, Northern Africa. And uh, interesting, has been successful in member states which had less attention for environmental issues, less attention for climate change, where cities were not pioneers like in Germany. So still we have all the major cities in Germany, so all the capitals, but you see Spain and Italy, more than 60% of the total number of participants. So interesting that the, the South pick up this initiative and, and Portugal as well, you can see the blue, the blue dots, uh, this initiative. Uh, more than other member states, but I say, another member state, most probably city, did, not, did already had an experienced culture to do this. Uh, for Italy, it was a, a, something, a novelty, and, and cities embarked this, also because they uh, were very much supported, and I come back to this, by provinces and regions, and there was also a lot of focus in, on helping them to finance the measures, because it's nice to do planning, but then you have to implement, and when it comes to implement, it costs money. And my colleague of the European Investment Bank, Rainer, will give you more information on their support line for the cities. Um, of, this initiative uh, is expected to contribute to about three gigaton of emission reduction in 20, uh, between 2030 and 2050. So it's not much, but it's still significant. If you think that uh, we are around 60 gigatons, we have to go down to 25. So it's, it's an important contribution. And also the Paris Agreement, the latest uh, discussion in uh, UNFCC, and the IPCC has recognized the role of non-state actor. So it's not po it's, uh, carbon uh, reduction, greenhouse reduction, are not anymore thought to become only by a nation, uh, uh, state, well, as we call it, but has to involve non-state actor, including uh, the, uh, the cities, of course, the private sectors, uh, everybody has to contribute, and, and the citizens. In the European Union, uh, what we can report is not what we project always, it's always nice to project, but what has been achieved by the cities who have already reported the emission reduction, there are about, uh, about 2,000 cities out, out of 800, so they've done a baseline emissions, then after four years they've done a monitoring inventories, and they already reduced 23%. So more than the EU target in a shorter period, because it's not 1990 to 2020, it's basically the baseline years is around 2010, 12 to 2017, 16. So in four years times, they've reduced radio emission by 23%. So remarkable results. Of course, it's not all due to city actions. They benefit from EU and national measures. If you have a decarbonization of the electricity sectors, if you have uh, uh, a building codes at national levels. Of course, city can reinforce this, uh, can have more stringent, as we heard from Heidelberg. Um, we have a database of all this, which is now is going to be open to, to academia with all the city plans, all the monitor reports, and about four, uh, 400,000 measures by these 800 cities. So a number of measures in buildings, uh, renewable energies, uh, mobilities, really uh, a wealth of different measures, including, as was uh, already mentioned from Heidelberg, a substantial role in information and awareness raising in all the stakeholders in the cities. Uh, just to go a bit more in details, we have a reduction in, in electricity consumption by 9%. Uh, it's all denominated in, in, um, in greenhouse gases or CO2 emissions. Uh, in heating and cooling, higher 26%, so a lot of action to insulate buildings, to have district heating, to have more efficient district heating and cooling. And also the transportation sector, only 5%, it's more difficult, but we see a lot of planned cities to go uh, for electric vehicles, banning uh, internal combustion engines in the city centers, or having congestion charges, or of course pushing a lot on uh, public transportation and even electric buses. Uh, walking and cycling in cities. And so we expect to get more result in transportation. So it's a very difficult sector to, to tackle, especially in historical cities or um, older cities. Um, cities that have reported to us, and it's the blue line at the bottom, already is 23%. If they continue to, at the current rate, they will go down to less than around one uh, tons per capita consumption, which is something that is, could be compatible with the Paris Agreement target. 
so very low emission that can be compensated by taking away emission so from uh, the atmosphere uh, with uh, <coughs> sinks. Uh, this is better than what the cities themselves projected because this is the red line, which is uh, the long-term target 2050. A lot of cities have carbon neutrality, minus 80, minus 75. So cities are doing better than what they committed to. And it's a very good thing to show that at a local level, things may happen faster than at a national level. Uh, Multi-level governance is a very important co uh, concept. And here we have a, a two dimension. It's, it's a, a vertical one, which has been already mentioned. So you have the international, the national, the regional, the local. All have to do plans, climate and energy, how to integrate this plan, how to help them. So a, a, a member state will have a strong component of emission reduction coming from cities with the city's engagement. And of course, at the national level, national health uh, to contribute as well. And it's also important to uh, recognize the new regime of the Paris Agreement. It's not anymore a command and control with target. Uh, you have to reduce so much uh, EU by 6 or 8 percent. Each nation has to do its own uh, commitment in the NDC, national determined contribution. And these, all the nations will make their best effort, and this should be over time reinforce this effort. So it's recognized that uh, uh, command and control is, is very difficult, but it's better to try to work with, uh, with pledges and commitment that are based on planning <coughs> and uh, that can be reinforced over time, involving all uh, actors. And this has been already happening at the local level, a regional level, and more and more, and so also a European level now. And, and it's important to see how these different plans interact and, and, and and make a coherent uh, um, frame from the local level up to the national international level. But also multi-level governance on the horizontal level is very important. Uh, so city network, uh, dialoguing with self, reinforcing each other, example of Heidelberg which is showing some different like C40, ICLE, the Covenant, um, and uh, energy cities in Europe. And also involving the multi-stakeholders, the cities, uh, the private sectors, the citizens, uh, how to uh, organize a city governance which is uh, uh, listening to the different uh, uh, parties, uh, stakeholders, and is basically getting them on board. Because a city, is, again, has, has limited power, it can, can do some regulation for buildings, can offer public transportation, might become forced somehow, but if citizens do not respond, if they don't buy these very efficient buildings, if they don't renovate the buildings, if they don't leave the cars at home and take public transport, it's very difficult for cities to achieve these targets. And, and another important point that is coming specifically for the Covenant of Mayor on, on governance is that uh, a majority of cities are signed up as small cities. And was already mentioned in the previous uh, presentation that they do not have capability to do planning. Uh, they don't have uh, resources. And uh, it's very interesting how uh, provinces and regions step in and help them with the planning. They maybe do joint plannings because they maybe share a network of uh, uh, public transportation or a district network is, is shared between the, uh, small um, cities or, or towns, and this can be organized better at provincial or regional level. And uh, not only this, but the regions can also have a, um, a strong role in uh, directing uh, finance into the cities uh, with the regional uh, funds coming from the commission or with other financial sources, and giving a lot of technical support. So this, uh, and this has been a success stories in see this participation of small cities doing the real cities plans with the help of provincial and, and regional uh, administration. Another important point that I've been, been working a lot is how to report emissions. And uh, there's been an international uh, team of experts which have come up with an harmonized reporting framework to capture the emissions in the city direct and indirect, what is really city responsibilities. Uh, for example, if a city owns a plan outside the cities, uh, still they can include uh, these in the emission factor of the cities, the, for example, the, the re re in relation to the electricity consumption, or if they buy green certificate 
or they sell the certificate. So a, a very uh, detailed accounting system for emission cities, which goes beyond the pure uh, uh, boundary of the local administration, the physical boundary, and allows for importing uh, green certificates or for benefits for investment done in a plant, maybe, which is located away, for example, we think offshore winds or other uh, possible renewable sources. Sorry, what's happening here? Quickly giving you some flavor of what city do in adaptation, uh, because it's becoming very important, and we should not forget about this. Um, climate change is there. There's no way we can avoid it. The temperature is already one degree above uh, the pre-industrial time. Uh, we very soon reach 1.5, most probably 2030s. And we already see at one degree the number of natural disasters we face uh, in different parts of Europe, uh, flooding, uh, high rainfalls, winds, uh, forest fires, forest fires last year, very nasty in Portugal and, and Greece, really hitting local community. And so we asked it not only to look at mitigation, but also adaptation, and again with their local uh, governance structure to take actions. And from a, a risk of vulnerability assessment that the city have to do, uh, they report us their uh, hazard, and now and now they see this hazard in, in 20 years. And you see the, uh, what is very worrying in Europe, uh, and this is the main hazard that the city, our city will face. And this hazard, hazard will, of course, impact on city infrastructures. And energy is one of the worst hit. So if you have uh, uh, a lot of storms, you know how uh, is uh, may hit the electricity distribution network or forest fires uh, that sometimes even trigger by uh, some poor uh, distribution transmission lines. Uh, and, and for example, the, the water sector may be very vulnerable. So if you have flooding, you may contaminate the water. So, uh, and c cities are not advanced as much as the mitigation. Europe is, is coming later, this adaptation. So they are mainly in the studying uh, uh, period that they try to, after make the risk and evaluation assessment, uh, study what they measures can uh, take to improve the reliability and the adaptation to climate change that's happening. And you see then the measures, they are greening, they planting trees, having more green areas to try to cool down, keep the temperature down, but also maybe to uh, uh, strengthen the res resistance of soil, maybe to sliding. Uh, in, in, again, uh, information and communication with citizens, try to, of course, to have also regulation to make buildings, not built in certain area or um, stronger building to resist to some of these hazard. So I just conclude saying that this has been a very successful initiative, very much supported by the Commission very high level, but it's not an initiative of the Commission, it's an initiative by the cities with the support of the Commissions, which allows to experiment uh, a mitigation and adaptation policies to spread them across Europe, to experiment this multi-level governance, and especially uh, in the energy part with a lot of new investment in, in renewables, in uh, uh, district uh, heating and cooling, uh, in uh, different models of participation by the, uh, the uh, private sectors in collaboration with cities. And of course also in adaptation, which is something new to, to Europe, that only now cities awake, but is very much demanded by citizens. I mean, if you have heat waves, uh, if you have uh, uh, forest fires, people die, citizens will really go back to the mayor and say, what are you doing to protect ourselves? So it's a very important dimension should not be forgotten. I thank you for your attention, and uh, I invite you to visit the, our website, where there's a lot of information and reports on the comment on mayors, the results, and also database of policy and data from cities. Thank you again. Thank you very much, and uh, we have a little bit more than 20 minutes for discussion. Who wants to start? Uh, thank you, Giuseppe Vellantorno, University of Trento. Mm, I have a question for the speakers. I'm not sure who is uh, interested in answering the question. The question is about uh, how difficult it is to have a very strong political commitment 
to local level, that is, for example, to what extent it is a, a bipartisan, bipartisan policy which is implemented independently from a change in the party or the coalition who is in power at local level, or whether there is any change in uh, the extent of the implementation or uh, how strong the commitment is when there is uh, a, a political change at local uh, level, and whether in your experience, city level, or regional level, the covenant of mayor, membership in a network, in a transnational network, there are tools for increasing a long-term perspective and strengthening commitment at local level. Does anyone of you wants to answer right away? Um, we had in Heidelberg the luck that two mayors were very ambitious about climate protection, so I can't compare it uh, because they were both very enthusiastic about it, but I think what is really helpful is to have a um, decision by the city council um, for special energy standards, for the passive house standards, for building uh, PV systems on roofs, that helps Im immense. But of course, if we have an election in May this year, so there could be um, just a rollback. So, and I think it's, at the moment, it's more difficult for cities because we have the um, discussion about um, energy standard versus um, social housing. So, and so in Germany, it's in every city a roll back because they say that the energy standards are too high, that cost too much, we want to have a lot of buildings and cheap buildings, and so there is a danger that there will be a back row in Germany. A follow-up question on that. Uh, so you basically say that ro rolling back this program seems extremely easy uh, what will indicate that there is no underlying political and social consensus on them. Is that your view that basically you have that, those policies because there was a mayor or two mayors that had the vision to do that, but they are actually not embedded in a strong uh, local social and political consensus? And if so, what do you think can be done for that consensus to exist? Because without it, then... Uh, uh, those policies are not sustainable, if they can be so easily rolled back, as you were saying. I'm sorry to put you on the, on the spot. But. I th think for cities it would be helpful we, if we have a strong national energy law. So that would help the cities. And on national, um, there is the rollback, not on the local level. So. So we believe strongly that the, the, the Covenant of Mayor helps cities to um, keep on going also with change of leadership. Uh, because the city has to sign, uh, has to be a decision of the council, has to be a strong consultation of stakeholders. And we believe that citizens now demand more and more from the cities. Uh, an example is air quality. In some cities in Europe, air quality is not anymore bearable. And so the citizens demand measures, which are very often same measures that are also useful for climate change, like to change the mobility system, to ban diesel cars, to, to do these things. So uh, at the end, there is a pressure on whoever comes in as, as new mayor selected a different party to, to respect what has been already uh, discussed and promises to citizens and as they call this. And this framework say, okay, you sign up, you, you plan to go there to 2020, you have to carry on. And this is remarkable also if you go outside uh, Europe and look at the US. Uh, as you know, Trump has want to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, but major cities will deliver what they committed and step in instead of the US central administration because they took en engagement from the cities because there's a, a citizen movement that wants their city to be better city, more livable cities, healthier cities. This is an interesting point, I think, also for our discussion throughout the day, is that, if I understand correctly, the point you're making is that uh, some form of external commitment uh, at the European level uh, then somehow helps to provide continuity and, and to bind beyond 
the electoral political cycles and uh, at, at, at the local level and at the national level. What emphasizes the importance of having either a governance or uh, a governance uh, agreement uh, and partnership that goes beyond that local level or a code of practice that goes beyond that local level because it provides, helps providing continuity and makes these policies less dependent on, uh, uh, on these risks of rolling back and national political uh, uh, circumstances. Well, in addition to that, I, I do think it's good to have a political debate on, uh, also at the local and regional level. I mean, uh, you, you mentioned social housing, there's energy poverty, all kinds of issues that uh, are become more prominent now uh, and more concrete at the local and regional level. So this is something that uh, cities and regions have to, have to deal with and need to be debated. So now we have, in the Netherlands, we have provincial uh, elections. We don't have formerly regions, so these are our regions. Uh, energy and climate is very much an issue there, and uh, it's not merely a technical issue anymore. It really uh, evokes uh, quite intense political debate on the costs of the energy transition and so on. So that doesn't necessarily mean uh, you know, um, things uh, will, will be rolled back and so on, but there, there is, and there, I think it's good to have a political uh, debate about that, and that is something that uh, you can actually have in, in a city uh, council or regional uh, assembly or whatever, because you can actually debate real things at the national level, it often, at least in the Netherlands. I mean, it often remains rather vague, if at all there is a debate on these things, right? So, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, that as an addition to the points made, I think it's good to have long-term strategies, etc. And I think, I think that's also possible at the lo local and regional levels. We've seen that. Uh, we do not want to have uh, the uh, uh, ro uh, rollbacks uh, in, 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 uh, um, um, as part of you know, populist uh, trends or whatsoever, but I do think it's good to have a political debate. Thank you. Philippe over there, can I make a, um, a suggestion to when you want to speak, it makes it easier for us to see it if you just do like this, okay? Philippe. Okay, thank, thank you. Philippe Redel is the French uh, Energy Law Association, but here, I'm, I'm, as a citizen, and the, feeling. And, if, and, and the Federation of Energy Law Association, but here is, is a personal um, question. The, there is a risk, in, uh, it, it's a great opportunity, and cities are definitely a good level. If you take the French situation at the moment, um, the president is discovering again that we have mayors and that they are very close to the citizens. However, there is a risk that some cities are more advanced than others. So I was wondering uh, if any um, city has ever thought about uh, twinning with a less advanced one or mentoring. You know, there are in, in, in other uh, transition periods, in other fields like uh, personal uh, training or competence, if someone is more advanced, there is solidarity um, and, and you can twin and, uh, or sponsor or, or, or mentor any sort of bilateral link between a city that's, that is very much advanced and another one that maybe would like but has not the capacities and does not know how to start. Um, I don't know if there's any other question before I give it back to the speakers. Does anyone want to? Yeah. Let's... Thank you, Miguel. I found very interesting this, this session with uh, a lot of very useful uh, information in, in the field that I would define as eco-social innovation, particularly in the intervention by, by Sabine. And uh, I would like to ask a little bit more about the education infrastructure that you are creating in, in, uh, in your, your territory, and also in terms of technical infrastructure the combination of the different services to energy, energy and, and also storage. And with regard to the cooperation puzzle, then it was mentioned by Martin and in connection with the reflection made by Philippe, to what extent do you consider it would be useful to create a set of harmonizing rules able for different uh, local communities with the legal uh, guidelines that it could serve all, also to diminish this puzzle in the cooperation at the, in, 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 at the level of local communities. Thank you. Any more questions? 
Jorge. It's, it's a remark and, and a request if you can comment on, on this point. Um, I think that we have been addressing the governance uh, uh, issue as, um, as a necessity arising from the fact that we have now non-binding targets. In the past, we had national ta binding targets, and so the responsibility of the member states was clear. Now we don't have, we just have a collective binding target. How can we share the responsibilities and the burden among the different member states? That's why we have this regulation on governance. And then we can go um, uh, along the, the, the scale and uh, ask what happens if some cities decide to be free riders and just to do nothing because they know that other cities will uh, provide a lot of uh, um, uh, reductions of the emissions. So the national target will be achieved without any effort. This is also a possibility, so the governance might be seen in this context also at the national scale. But th this is the one aspect. This is what happens if someone does not comply with the collective goal. But th the, the other side of, the, of this governance um, problem is, are we sure that the way cities, municipalities, regions are organizing their new um, energy-related management is fully compatible with the pre-existing internal market rules. To be very blunt, are we, for instance, creating in some parts of Europe some local monopolies when we abolished monopolies 20 years ago? So that's the, the other side of the governance uh, issue that I think we should also maybe discuss. So I have two more, and then I'll give it back to the... I have a question, question myself, and then I give it back to the panel. Lucila? So, um, thank you for the presentations. Uh, I would like to, as far as you both mentioned about financing, uh, the, how, the importance of finance, um, uh, the, 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 the regulation on building renovation, uh, performance of buildings, um, the new regulation is clear, the, uh, the attempt of uh, attracted private finance and have private finance as a primary, a primary uh, resource and the public finance as uh, uh, to correct the market failures when you don't have it. So to what extent do you see um, uh, this happen, like the, the private finance banks or other instruments of finance uh, reacting and responding to this call? Joshua? Yeah, my, my, my question sort of relates to, to what you were saying earlier about the other existing regulations and how the governance regulation or whatever we're doing, how we want to empower cities is sort of impacted by this because we have a whole heap of legislation. We have concession directives uh, that, that do have a basis in the internal market. However, and, and at the same time, you also have uh, some cities who are more empowered by their national legal systems to be active in the market than others. Um, so there is a sort of regulatory level, unlevel playing field there. So how do we sort of address this? Because um, a lot of the people I talk to say that the existing EU legislation actually hampers the ability of cities to take more active role. For instance, in Barcelona, they're setting up a utility company and, um, and they, they have a public procurement rules standing in their way. And so they're essentially, they're still going forward, but they are they are basically limiting the, the market that they can actually go after within the city uh, simply because the, the legislative hurdles are too, too burdensome. So, yeah, I mean, just how, how do we sort of address that in a holistic way to make sure that we are actually coherent uh, across the board? Thank you. Uh, I have one, one additional question that was uh, came to my mind by a couple of the interventions and made me curious. Oh, the league, you also... No, no, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for all the presentations, too. I have um, a question that follows on uh, from the last two remarks um, relating to, to governance at this level. I mean, you often see local authorities wearing several hats. And what I see... Um, 
in the Netherlands, where I'm also based and where I sit in a, a mining, what's called the Mining Council, um, to review licenses for um, hydrocarbons, which includes geothermal energy. And we have a lot of local initiatives uh, where the local authorities are the sponsors of these projects. They're financing the projects. They will offtake the energy from these projects. But they also are supposed to conduct public consultations to see if people want these projects. Um, and geothermal has some rather long-term uh, issues, you could say. Um, uh, but in this new constellation, one wonders whether there is uh, there are sufficient checks and balances. So that's my question. Thank you. And, and just to conclude my, my question, um, uh, there, there was mention here of social innovation, and I was wondering, uh, one of the areas that has grown exponentially, in which I've worked myself uh, both when I was in government in Portugal and more recently on a report for the European Commission, uh, is social impact bonds. And that can be used in the environmental area, in the energy area too, and that increasingly being used at local level. So I was just curious to know whether you are aware of whether any impact bonds on this area. You know what I talk about? It's basically that uh, the public authorities establish a target. It can be redu reduction of energy consumption, for example, in a particular community. And they uh, uh, contract, they make a tender for someone that comes and proposes to do that. And then they are only paid if, by the public authorities if they are successful. So they gather the, mar the, the money in the market to fund that project. And then uh, the investors on that project uh, are rewarded on the basis of, uh, and if that public objective, for example, that reduction of energy consumption in that local community is attained. This has been used in a variety of social domains, education, for example, uh, also respect on employment for refugees, and local communities have taken the lead in a lot of these cases. I was wondering if there were examples that you were aware of in this area. By the same order, perhaps. You don't need to answer all the questions, just I think all the three of you, otherwise we'll go beyond uh, uh, the coffee break. And that's also a fundamental right, I think. But uh, you can select which to one. So concerning the question of Felipe, concerning twinnings, we had two projects under the head of Energy Cities um, that was uh, building local intelligent energy forums in Europe. So there were 20 cities of Europe working together um, concerning citizen participation. And the other one, what I just presented very shortly, was the engage poster campaign. So the, this was a communication strategy on climate protection um, to involve citizens. And that was a project with 12 cities in Europe. And I think for twinning, it's good if you do it with your um, twin sister cities. So for instance, in France, we have Montpellier or in, in Great Britain, Cambridge. So there is also an exchange between the cities on environmental issues. But also, it's necessary to have a um, funding by the European Commission uh, to do these twinnings. Concerning the question education from you, I think it's important to invest in structures so, and in further education programs. So we have in every school a teacher who is responsible for energy issues and also in the kindergartens the head of the kindergarten is responsible that education for sustainable um, development is introduced in the kindergarten and also in the sports club. So that is the structural um, level. And also we try to train the people that they really know about climate protection and environmental issues. Concerning the question of Lucida, um, finance programs, we have done it because of um, strengthening craftsmen and architects, and it's also um, a rollback. So for every euro we invest, we get seven euros back in the city with the pro program. And we have done it because of the national laws are too low, and we said we cannot reach our ambitious climate goals in Heidelberg if we only renovate buildings with the low level. And so that was the decision of the city council. Then we get 
give people money that they do a higher insulation. And the last question from you concerning, uh, I think this was energy contracting, what was your question? or? Yes, yes, similar to that, let's say like that. Yeah, we had some programs with schools and sports facilities, so the investor was paid by... But they yeah. success. Yeah, pay exactly. Success. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, I think you also asked about, if I, if I understood correctly, about do we need some rules, procedures, um, at, and if so, uh, um, at what level perhaps? Uh, I think it's important to leave sufficient room for maneuver, flexibility, uh, adaptation, but at, at a higher level to have some guidance on what would be Good, right? So, uh, in, in terms of or, uh, what would be um, uh, in line with existing uh, legislation, for instance, and I think that's actually uh, so. I'm trying to combine the two questions here. That's uh, that's actually uh, a very good point. I, I refer to coordination between levels, uh, um, uh, but I think between you know subfields or le legislative uh, um, packet, packages or legislative. Uh, um, um, frameworks that's an, another area I didn't discuss yet but I I think I mean there's hardly any uh, f f as I uh, um, experience there's not so much uh, awareness of the EU f uh, legislative framework <laughs> whatsoever at the local regional level and especially not when it comes to the all the the, the um, directives and regulations referred to before uh, so uh, and so I, in that sense, I think it would be good if you have at, at some level some guidance code, whatever you want to call it. So what if you op, if you act at the local or regional level, what you know, what do you need to take into account? What uh, but also from a more positive uh, pr uh, perspective, what synergies can be made, etc. So there's, I mean, at the local level, there's also all kinds of you know air pollution uh, um, uh, laws and policies, etc. That you can uh, perhaps uh, uh, link up with. So it works both ways: what you can't do, what you perhaps can or should do, and in in a better way. Um, so that try to combine the two questions in some way. So I think there's there's um, um, so the, the challenge is you want to leave cities and regions a level of freedom, so some room for maneuver, but not without obligations and not without taking into account existing legal uh, obligations and framework. So that's, that's for me, is something that if you can find a way, that would be, be good. And I, the best way is if you can, uh, um, I think, prepare that uh, some way in, in some bottom-up way, not from the top down, but to have to, to gather experiences as part of you know kind of peer to peer learning on you know what cities and regions have already come across whatever works and what you know in that in that type of way um, so I think the lo so the local authorities uh, wearing several hats I, 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 I see your point and the checks and balances this is what I, I referred to before I think it's good to have a political process at the local and the regional level as well so to have no, uh, uh, political parties check on this. I think this is also where the national level should and uh, could be involved to check at the higher level whether uh, local and regional authorities do not, uh, uh, you know, cross certain boundaries. So there's there's multiple ways in which I think you can uh, um, some way create or, or reinforce certain checks and balances there. I, I leave it. Thank you. Paul. Yes. Thank you for the question. A very challenging questions. On the twinnings, uh, at European level, we work very much in twinning uh, EU cities with uh, cities outside the EU, in particular in developing countries, because there is a, a lot of experience, and you see Adebayo much has done in the EU that can be useful in South America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Far East Asia, so it's, it's interesting. There's less of maybe attention to um, uh, at the European level, but as I said, uh, regions have maybe an important role to uh, organize between maybe capital cities in the regions and as small as communities, smaller villages, and, and do kind of training and support and financial technical support. Uh, finance is another important point because everything needs money 
in the city to happen. Uh, public transportation, better buildings, um, renewable energies, and a lot of, of cities are in a uh, poor uh, financial situation. I mean, they are very constrained budget, they are deficit. Uh, so maybe uh, they should redesign maybe their local taxes, taxation systems, uh, try to focus that more on, on climate change. For example, uh, congestion charges for me is a very good uh, tool that can be useful to raise money at the same time uh, impose, uh, you know, state regulation on type of car that can enter the city, raise tax to, to force to invest in public transportation. Uh, green bond maybe could be another interesting things that they can raise money to do renovation of buildings. Um, there are a lot of, of course, of EU and uh, uh, international banks, uh, credit lines or grants also to do uh, activities in cities. I think what is very important, most probably, is to link more and more uh, the, um, the grants or the uh, financial coming from, from the IB, but we have the IB expert in the next session will tell you all about this, to the performance of the city, climate change performance, uh, uh, city planning. Do you have a good plan? You're credible. And there's a lot of emphasis on uh, pro, uh, measure by measure, try to, sh uh, to help cities to identify how much this, these measures are bankables, how much city uh, banks can invest in this project, um, uh, large international banks uh, to the local banks, uh, because some projects have uh, a, a good dividend. And maybe I disagree with my panelists who can discuss that. Uh, uh, efficient uh, low consumption buildings, especially if you go new construction, are more expensive. They might be initial investment, but then there is a strong reduction in energy cost. And, and this might be, if you allow 20, 20, 30 years payback time, social housing is an example where you can design uh, with public money very efficient buildings because they last 30 years with a low consumption for new buildings. Um, and a comment maybe on targets. I mean, the youth, by uh, definition, can only act uh, at, with member states. But even with member states, we have we've seen a change, a shift in the renewables directive from imposing specific targets to uh, each member state, which was not done for efficiency, for example, to say, OK, this is your target. Try to do the best to do your own contribution. And, uh, and, and so we have the 32% 30, 30 target, but it's not anymore allocated to each member. So you have to do 17, 28, 58, but try to do your best. And we see the same in climate change. Uh, there's not anymore a target for uh, countries, developed countries, but it's a thing. everyone has to do his own best efforts. And, and since the, the, the EU cannot, of course, address directly cities, uh, they recognize that city can do a contribution, and there is this uh, uh, tendency to, uh, to get them to engage themselves, to set their own target, to understand that is, they cannot uh, stay away from the discussion. And, uh, and this is a combination, I would say, of pressure from the, the, the higher level and national international levels, but also from the citizens. And, and this is very important. Uh, local elected officials cannot anymore ignore the request of citizens for better cities, uh, more citizen-friendly, and this goes directly to, to climate change issues, especially adaptation, uh, mobilities, uh, who would like to live in a city which is as congestion, uh, poor air quality, and compared to a city where you can walk, cycle, have parks, and the temperature maybe doesn't get too hot because of this green area. So I think this is a, a strong social demand. Social innovation is very important how to, to uh, collect this way, consult the citizens and stakeholders and, and bring this into policy makers and changing basically this idea that everything is top down but more and more uh, should be bottom up. Uh, building from bottom up and then reaching the top down targets. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the panel and those contributed to the discussion. We now have a coffee break of 15 minutes. Uh, I think we can take the full 15 minutes even if we start five minutes later. Uh, and uh, please, m uh, those that are in the next panel, maybe you can already bring your uh, name, uh, tags, and your materials here, and we take it ours to the place where you are. <laughs>